Welcome everyone once again to Simply Painting and welcome to Burnt Umber Country. This is Blackwater Bog in the Bog of Allen in County Offaly. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. This bog land covers about 30% of the total county and what they do with it is this. They strip a little bit off the top. They take it on miles and miles of track back to the power station and that's what they use to make the electricity. Blessing. Anyway, this is a schlein and it's the implement used to cut turf for domestic use. And the record, they say, is 100 sods in a minute. I think we can beat that. So let's go. One. <laughs> One and a half. 59. 60. 77. 78, 79, 100. Well, that's taken care of that little chore, so to speak. Now let's go and find something to paint. Well, I just thought I'd let you see what the bog looks like in its original state. This is what it looked like before they drain it. In fact, they've refilled this and rejuvenated it. And it's a wildlife park. However, this is now a piece of bog oak, which was dug out of the bog, many thousand years old indeed. And we're going to now go and meet a man who can do the most fantastic thing to this thing. So let's do just that. Well, I did tell you I was going to introduce you to a real expert on bog oak and bog timber. Michael, this is fantastic. Maybe you'll just explain to me, first of all, what you're doing, and then maybe tell us about colorization and how you evolve these pieces yeah, that you do, these absolutely. marvelous pieces. Well, this is bog yew, and it's been dug out of the bogs here in the Midlands. And, and those, the trees? those trees, there are about 6,000 we had at Carbon Dish. The forests were all here. This was after the last ice age. And whatever happened, there was a climatic change. And the trees fell, and the bogs have grown now under them, mm -hmm. 20 or 30 feet, that way down in there. And that's we take them out, yes. That's where you find yeah. them. And of course, I noticed that uh, your particular work, and I so much admire it, that you don't actually get a block of wood and just hack away. No. Y you what you do is you evolve a shape yeah. out of the thing yeah. by using nature yeah. itself. I, I, I follow the form, and out of all this chaos, I have to find order yes and yes. Uh, this is going to turn into a past the candle will be a huge pasty candle will be emerging really? out of this you yeah. know and colorization tell me about that I oh yeah you were admiring the color wonderful. well look yeah. uh, i'll just show you a piece of it here yeah it's almost a rich wine color, yeah you can it? see when i penetrate huge. below the surface there um, yeah it's wonderful isn't that wonderful yeah i mean and, and that's been six thousand years before yeah. anybody since anybody's seen that that's <laughs> right and then uh, i um i start sanding uh rasping first and then six grades of sandpaper very very rough yeah. and it evolves down to a very fine one and then the finished work you saw was with beeswax, you it's know, that... Uh, so it's all totally natural. Yeah, so that, that colour, whatever, I, I don't... They don't seem to know the botanist or anybody how it comes, but uh, they say it's from the acids and liquids that submerge in, in into in the, the wood, in you know. Well, yeah. it is just so wonderful. And I mean, it's such so different that you've got to sit and think the thing through. Well, you know, this is a painting programme. So with Michael's permission, I'm going to go off and find something for you to paint. So let's go. Hello there. Well, this is a piece of bog oak, obviously, and this bottom piece here is just a piece of timber out of the bog, and the top is a nice carved dolphin. I got that in a little crescent, you see. I thought it's lovely. 4,000 years old, just imagine that. It's marvellous, isn't it? Anyway, let's get back to the old painting. We wandered around the bog there that day, and I found a lovely little area which we're going to paint. So you're probably champing at the bit, ready to go, brushes in hand and all that. But before you do, Let's just run through the materials you're going to need to paint this lovely picture. First of all, we've got watercolours. There are six of them. And it's ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, lemon yellow, raw sienna, burnt umber, and Payne's grey. You've got three brushes. You've got the large goat hair, you've got the small goat hair, and you've got the rigger. 
we've got some water, some cloths, you've got the tray, which is our pallet, and then we've a sheet of paper which measures 14 by 10, and this time it's long wise, therefore we're painting a landscape. So without further ado, let's get at it. Now, before you rush off there, let's remember, arise in sky, middle and foreground, have some more fun, let's do it. First of all, let's draw the horizon line. And this time it's fairly high because we want to show plenty of the bog down here. It was a nice, yes, nice piece of bog. And the next thing is we're going to go a little bit different this time as well. We're going to first of all get the large brush, take some of the lemon yellow. Now make sure your brush is absolutely clean and you've got some nice clean lemon yellow because what we're going to do is put in kind of a sunny, you know, it's a sunsetty time. I'm going to just paint in some lemon yellow. Leaving out a little bit of white here and there, right more or less in the center of the, of the picture, of the sky, okay? Now we're gonna add in some nice alizarin crimson, which is, happens to be right next to the lemon yellow. The idea is you put the, pic the colors you want one beside the other, it makes it easy. And then we're gonna wipe in some nice red color, look at that. Now this, in fact, is wetting the page for us. We didn't wet the page first this time, did we? You remember that, don't you? But now we're wetting it. Look, back to the old, and we started a bit from the bottom of the page this time. There we go, there's our nice yellow in. Now we're gonna add in some of the ultramarine blue, and we're gonna add that to the alizarin crimson, and we're gonna get a lovely purple color. Now I've got a racing right along here, he says, because we don't want to take too much time. There we go, look at that, that's the, the sky is, Beautiful purpley color, as you'd sometimes get in the evening skies, won't you? And get underneath again. Take a time with this. You've got a whole two minutes to do it, haven't you? Hey, it's a long time if you work it out. Now, we probably need a little bit more there, just up on top. And once it's wet, we're safe. It's when it starts to dry, that's when the problem arises, isn't it? You, pr you probably realize that. So we can give it another little switch of purple. Now, we're going to get out the old hair dryer in a tick now and just give him the quick blast. Oh, I rather like that. You know when you get excited about a colorization you got, I think, I think that's a good sky. Hmm. Okay, hair dryer, let's give it a blast. We gave that a really good dry and it's turned out very nice. Now, if it happens that your sky isn't quite the same, don't worry. And in fact, if it's turned out not so well at all, remember to turn the page over and start again. Because you've only wasted two minutes of your time. Anyway, you know, I've got a bit of a confession to make as well. You know that sod digging record that I went for, the Guinness Book of Record? Yeah, it's 100 sods in a minute. I was just outside it, I have to admit. It took me one hour and 12 minutes to dig those, so I was one hour and 11 minutes out, but I figure with a bit of practice, I'll probably be able to manage it. Anyway, just thought I'd let you know that. Kind of a pity, isn't it, yeah. Well, okay, we've reached the horizon line, we're now going to go underneath the horizon line, and my next move is, I'm going to paint in the water, the bog, you know the way the bog is, and there's rushes and weeds in the bog, I'm gonna put the water in, and then we'll put the rushes in on top of it. Always paint from the back forward. You got that? Yeah, of course you have. Right, so big brush again, let's get some watercolor. And this time, I think a good colorization for the water this time would be some of the blue and the red. So in other words, make it close to the sky color. Now remember, we can test it. We got a little doodle area here. How's that? Ah, we might darken it a bit, so fair enough. Let's do that. That's pretty good, I'm happy with that. Now. Let's go. Now I'm just gonna leave it the top part without too much paint. I'm just gonna go like that, look. And then underneath that again, and once more. Now that's our water. Now you'll notice I've left a bit of white up at the top. That's the way I want it. Now that's the water in. Now we can fill in between that. So we've gotta dry it first, so. So let's give it a quick dry. Now there we are, we've dried it, so let's get on to the next bit. Remember, you paint from the back forward, from and you paint light to dark, and you dry as you go. They'd be 
the three commandments of watercolor painting. If you do that, you'll never have any problem. And it becomes second nature eventually. Yes, it's very easy. Now let's, uh, let's get by. Why don't we get the little brush out now and try it and put in some small reeds and rushes right on the horizon line first. So we're taking some raw sienna and just on the horizon, it's a little downward strokes with a brush like that, look. The reeds are a long way away, so. Just to define our horizon line, see? Now we can darken that if we want, but remember, it's safe always if we, if we go light to dark. So in other words, put the light coloring in first, and then you can darken it. Have a little bit there, look at that. And the brush is quite dry now, and I'm leaving out little bits and pieces. These are reeds or rushes or whatever, I, I don't know, there's all kinds of different names, but we call them reeds or rushes. Now it's starting to get into shape up, isn't it? Now we go a bit darker. And down like that, look. Look at that. Hmm. You know, a couple of things to remember about painting is always start easy. Don't try and take on a project that's a way above your abilities because we all go up like that to improve. It's like any other sport or any other hobby. You know, when I mention the word hobby, I often think I have so many people come up to me. I'm a member of an art club. And so I mean, get people come up to me and say, Frank, do you suffer for your art? And I always say, no, but I did have a job like that once, but I gave it up. Now I paint and I'm happy. What does it mean, suffer for your art? This is a hobby we're at. Why should you suffer for something you enjoy? Now keep looking at what you're doing here. Now that's one, you see, I, I got, the brush itself is doing this, because these goat hair brushes, they split a little bit. So the point of them becomes little spikes, and that's where you get that impression of reeds or rushes. And I hear people say, I can't do this, honestly. Did you know that Einstein was a dunce? Did you know that? That's true, he's put out of school. He was told he was a dreamer, and he had no attention span, and he was put out of school. <laughs> Einstein. And in fact, I believe when some of his great, his, the law of relativity, when he first started to think about that, he was lying on the bank of a river, he was half asleep, his eyes closed, and that's what it came to him. So maybe you should go into your boss now and suggest to him that uh, if you went, took a few weeks off and lay beside a river bank, that you'd probably be a better employee and that you'd think up all great ideas for the business. But that's a fact. So don't be disheartened by this business of people saying to you, uh, you can't do it and it's very difficult and everything else. No, it's not. It's very easy. Once you can train the old brain, the brain's a great thing, I can tell you. We're all born with one. We're all born with that computer. It's only a matter of us putting the information into it. Now, I'm going to take some yellow here and some blue. I'll bring it out here on the other side. These palettes, you see, I've got two sides to them. This side here is, a, is, a, is, is, is different. I can keep it. It's a kind of a spare side here. So I've, I, I've got loads of place for mixing my paint. Now, remember, you've got to take your time mixing your paint because it does take, remember that, 99% of your time. Now, this is a kind of a greeny color I'm putting in here. Now, you keep leaning back a bit and looking at it to make sure that the thing is working out as you planned. Because if you get your nose stuck in the painting like that and you stay there, lo and behold, you may stand back from it and all of a sudden realize that it doesn't make any sense at all, or you've got an elephant's head up in the middle of the sky here, which can often happen. So look back at it, or better still, you'll often see artists going squinting. You know, like this, you think, what's wrong with them? Well, there's nothing, because when you close your eyes a little bit like that and you look at the picture, you only see the main masses. You understand that? So therefore, you can discern what you want, because don't worry about the detail. The difference between photography and painting, the main difference is, you do not have to worry about detail in painting. I'm coming on down here a bit again, see? Now, I'm going to change the big brush in a minute. And you know, you've got a great fun with this. Here's a tip for you. When I started to paint, not so many years ago, indeed, sold my business and 
Went to a painting group, was told I couldn't paint, that I would be, wasn't able, so I thought this is a bit ridiculous. Nobody's showing me how, why, how can I possibly know? Anyway, for my first winter, the first Christmas that came along when I was painting, I painted the one picture, I'll never forget it, it was out of a calendar, and it was um, a forest, a green forest scene. <laughs> and all my friends all got a picture of a green forest scene. I lost a lot of friends <laughs> because, <laughs> but however, I had painted, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 of these things. And by the time it came along to Christmas Eve, boy, oh boy, I could knock out these things at speed like you never saw in your life. And that's how I really learned to paint above all things else. And I think if you try that the same, use your poor friends as the, as the guinea pigs. Huh? Now you see the way it's beginning to, you can see the, the reeds, because a bog is exactly what it says. It's, it's not just flat water, there's water with reeds, because it's quite shallow, although not advisable to walk in it, I might tell you. Now we're getting down here to the bigger one, so I think we need to get the bigger brush now going. And keep the brush fairly dry. So in other words, it's now getting to the stage where I have there's probably fair to say that there's more paint than water on the brush. And it's flicks, see? Flicks of the brush, look at it. See that? Okay. And we're gonna come down this side here. Look at that, how's that? We're gonna give this a bit of a dry in a minute because I think it's uh, it's getting a bit. Just give it a run with the old hairdryer every so often. It just keeps things in order for you. Look at that. How's that? Huh? Let's give that a quick dry. Don't take a tick. Now we've got it nice and dry, so the next move is we're coming down. Now this part here is land. It's not, this is not bog. And we're gonna put a little bush or two up there. But, but let's get the um, small brush out again. We're gonna make up some, there's a kind of a green bush here. It was a quite a low one. You get them growing in the bud. Willows, I think they are. They like water and they like damp areas. So let's put a couple of willows in. They're nice, they have these little white, uh, little white kind of flowers on them, they're very nice. And this is a small brush, and you see it's now become, I call this my obedient brush. That's the great thing about goat hair, you can call them that, your obedient brush. Because when you put them in a set, if I press it down and pick it up, it then looks like that. It won't spring back. You see, if, if you have um, nylon, or sable, they're made in such a way that no matter what you do with them, they spring back to the original shape. These don't, the goat hair. And that's why you can get these lovely shapes. And you can call, this is called stippling. Where are my willows now? Now I don't worry, I'm gonna put a little, couple of little, uh, there you are, couple of little scrapes with the nail. Try it, clean it off, then you've got your willows. So clean off our brush now, we're going down to the bottom here now. We might even put a couple of carrots into this, I don't know if we can. See, the world is your oyster. You've, you've got the background done the way you want it now. Now we're gonna dry off this brush, the big one, because we're now gonna put in some, some nice pointy reeds down here. Ah, there we go. I think we're a bit dull looking there, aren't we? So bit empty, yeah, so we put a few in there. See, we're coming right. Now, why do I work down the page? Did you ever figure that one out in watercolor? You always do, and do you know why? Well, there's two reasons. One is Newton's law. Because this is all angled a little bit that way, it's a little higher at the back than the front, the natural tendency for the water in the p is to run down the page, and I can control it that way. And there's a second more practical reason. If I was to work the other way up, my sleeve of my lovely shirt would now be covered in paint. Whereas I'm coming this way, I've always got a clean sleeve. Common sense, that's all it is. 
But the main one, of course, is to let the paint run down the page. Now, let's make up some green paint. And to do that, we will need yellow and blue. And believe it or not, we're now running out of yellow paint. Now, the thing to do when you're running out of paint is to take more out and put it out. You can, you, you probably know that. But you know, it's a crazy thing that uh, we don't do it. So many pictures are ruined at the very end because the person who's painting the picture finds they're running out of paint, so what they do is they use anything that's left on the palette. Doesn't matter what it is, mud, doesn't matter, mix up any old four colors just to get the paint on. Oh, for goodness sake, don't do that. I used to do it. Yeah. Paint is cheap. Now, watch this, look, nice swipe of green, uh, another nice swipe of green. See, that's a bit of green grass. That's where I was actually standing that day, yeah. That bog is beautiful, beautiful. There's more railway tracks in that bog than there is in the total railway system of Ireland. Not that we have a big railway system, but that's just to tell, it's a lot of mileage. Yeah. They are a bit rickety though. The guys who laid those tracks, I can tell you, I wouldn't like to see them with a 100 mile an hour train running on them. Now you see I've got the bottom bit done there. Now I start adding in, this is just some some nice little downward strokes, isn't I? I'm quite pleased with this. They're beautiful, actually, these bogs, particularly when you get at sun, either a sunset or sunrise, because that's when you get the, the colors and are they're just, just beautiful. So you've got to come to Ireland and examine the bogs, he says, yeah? Actually, we, we, I think we generate something like 50 or 60% of our, our power electricity. It's all generated by burning turf. So we're not as silly as we look. In fact, I think we were the world leaders in that at one stage. Everybody came to see our, our turf burning turbines. Cheap fuel. And it's lovely as well. You can bake potatoes on turf and it's lovely because it, it, it's not like coal. It doesn't blacken things. Okay, now I'm, gonna I'm getting down here to a, a nice finish on this. I might have to give this another little swipe because it's a bit mean looking. A little bit there. Now, we need to make some really deep green. And how would I do that? Well, the yellow is the basis of all greens, isn't it? So if I take some of that yellow there and bring it over, and I've got some Payne's Gray here, which I put out. Now, Payne's Gray gives me a kind of an olive green color. And it really is dark. See? It's lovely. So you can make 40 shades of green, that's what they say. Well, 40 shades of green is very easy to make, and you don't need tubes of green paint to do it. I do keep harping on about that, don't I? I don't like green paint, and I don't. I'm sure the green paint manufacturers must hate me, but, yeah, well, if you can make other colors, you can use that. Now, yeah, there's a little bit of, little bit of darkness. Of now, I'm gonna give that a good dry, because we've got some birds and little things to put in now. So just one more dry. There we go, we gave it a good dry because I want to go up here and I don't want my arm. Remember I mentioned about the arm thing? Yeah. Now the birds. <laughs> this is one of the occasions when you can put in as many birds as you like because you could have a flight of birds over the bog, couldn't you? So off we go. Now a bird is a letter V. And very quickly I want to show you, there's three stages of a bird. A V, a flatten it, and round it. That's all it is. So we want this one, the third one, the, the rounded one. And we put a bird in here. And put a smaller one below him, huh? And now we got a, and a third one. So there's three birds flying in. There you go. And one last thing to do now. Let's do the old signing. And then when we sign the picture, we don't touch it anymore. We put our little mount on. You want a little mount, a little piece of cardboard, put it across it. And as we do this, sad to say, we have to say to you, from Frank Clark, as we say in Ireland, Shlon Lat, which is goodbye. And remember, try this out, and you too can have 